tell us about this place. Tell us about Ames Plantation. How it was established, yes. how it all came to be, because a lot of people, you know, from East Tennessee in that Eastern time zone, and I had to move down here when I, Me it's a too. lot better time zone. <laughs> but, uh, I had never heard of Ames Plantation. You just uh, moved to God's country. I, That's what you No, did. <laughs> I don't know about that. I moved to that flat land. What are you talking about? Swamp land. The award-winning Tennessee Wildcast is on the air with the latest on hunting, fishing, boating, wildlife watching, and all things outdoors. Make welcome your host, drummer and outdoor expert novice, Jason Harmon. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Tennessee Wildcast. We're glad you're tuning in. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We are at Ames Plantation once again. We've been here before, and we're glad to be back. Uh, we've got Dr. Carlisle with us once again, and Miss Amy Spencer's helping me co-host. And we're in an awesome room here with some pretty cool wallpaper. And we're going to get to all this history and, and learn about this place today. We could do a gazillion shows on Ames Plantation. I mean, there's just, it's the history. A lot of history. Yes. Of history. So uh, I'm excited to jump right in. Uh, first, we're going to meet Mr. Mr. Carlisle. Dr. Carlisle, we thank you for being here. And we just want to learn yes, a little bit about you. Good to have and, you. And start there, if you don't mind. So no. how, how did you end up here, and, and what's your career been so far? I mean, you're, you're about to retire, I've heard. So. Not far, about Not two far. years off, and, and we'll do that. But I was uh, I finished up my BS and Master's down at Mississippi State and was looking for a place to go get a Ph.D. from. And so I went to the University of Tennessee, Okay. and we moved there in the spring, I think, of 78 uh, in March. The first week, so we moved from Eastern, I mean, from Central Time Zone to Eastern Time Zones. So that was a culture shock. <laughs> and then a week later, we had daylight savings time hit, so I lost oh, another hour. Yeah. You were all messed up. It's the up. worst part about Central Time. <laughs> and then that same week, I got to come to Ames Plantation for the very first time in March of 79. And I actually did my, uh, my research work for my Ph.D. on these grounds. And so I got to meet everybody here, uh, Dr. Anderson, who eventually hired me, and Mr. Jimmy Bryan, the former superintendent. And he was a trip within himself, I promise you. That was Charlie Frank's dad. And, and so... Yeah, well, now we know where he gets. So we, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and so I did my research here three years, and uh, it was about the end of the second year, I guess. Uh, they approached me about applying for a job here, and they had already applied. They had already put it up for, uh, you know, trying to hire somebody before me, and they didn't like any of the applicants, so they closed it up. Wow. And they they put it out there again, and I was one of uh, five applicants that applied. And so I interviewed, and I wound up getting the job. I think what helped me out more than anything is I come from a farming background, and uh, we had beef cattle, and we had uh, row crops, and so that's what's here, and, and that's how we uh, we have a production outfit here. And so we're, we're always trying to make money because we're basically self-sufficient at this mm -hmm. location. And so... Uh, with that background, they hired me, and then it was a question of learning about bird dogs and uh, field trials. And past that, I already knew how to ride horses. I grew up riding horses and uh, rode high school rodeo and college rodeo oh. down at Mississippi State. So, cool. uh, yeah, I could ride anything that walked, but... Uh, that's got to be a, that's a requirement for the job here. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting, but we moved here in December of 81, and I officially started first day on the job as the assistant superintendent in January of 82 and served 10 years as the assistant superintendent, then 10 years as the associate superintendent, and then I took over. They changed superintendent to director, and I became center director in, uh, in December of uh, – of O two is when Dr. Anderson retired, and I took over January of O three. So wow. I'll have uh, in two more years. I'll have forty years, and that's enough for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to retire and go hang out with the grandkids. And all there that you kind of go. Stuff, there right? you go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I hear you. Well. Let's jump right in. Tell us about this place. Tell us about Ames Plantation. How it was established, yes. how it all came to be, because a lot of people, you know, from East Tennessee in that Eastern time zone, had I had to move down here, when it, Me it's a too. lot better time zone. <laughs> but uh, I'd never heard of Ames Plantation. You just uh, moved to God's country. I, That's what you No, <laughs> I don't know about that. I moved to that flat land. What are you talking about? Swamp land. But, uh, but oh. I had never heard of Ames. So I, 20 years ago, had to learn all this and 
still not exactly sure exactly how everything works with the Hobart Ames Foundation trustees. So explain a little bit. It's very that. unique. Mr. Ames, uh, uh, Mr. Ames was on a cruise. Uh, he and uh, his wife in the late 1890s, and they happened to meet uh, uh, Mr. Duryea from Memphis. And he was a big quail hunter, and Mr. Ames was a big quail hunter, and they got to talking, and, and he learned about West Tennessee and the abundant amount of quail at that time. And so he checked out the area, and then he decided to purchase, so he bought the manor house and a 1,000 acres of land, and then he started on a leasing buying spree until at one point he had amassed a little over 25,000 acres. Now, he sold a portion of that, and today we have 18,400 acres. Mm. Now, he acquired most of his land by 1938 and he never paid over three dollars an acre for anything wow now he we, we completely <laughs> surround one area you know, we call it the walker track uh kind of to the to the northwest uh, it's 565 acres in there and we completely surround that now mr ames had the opportunity to buy that for three dollars and fifty cents an acre and he said it was overpriced <laughs> <laughs> you know, wow. sometimes if, you just like to keep only known. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, but anyway, so Mr. Ames, uh, Mr. Ames put this place together. Now, Mr. Ames was a very unique individual. He uh, uh, he was a very wealthy uh, New England industrialist. His great grandfather started the Ames Shovel and Tool Company in uh, in 1774 with his brother, and then uh, as it was developed. Uh, uh, Mr. Ames became CEO of that company in 1899, and he was CEO from 1899 to 1924. And it was during that time period that he bought the manor house and bought that 1,000 acres and then started adding to that. Mm -hmm. And that's when he got into field trials. That was the reason he was here was because of the bird dogs and, and uh, you know, and, and the, the amount of quail that was here and so he just he kept doing that wow and uh he had a very unique lifestyle he and Ms. ames would come down here uh, usually in late december and they would stay here for about three months uh through the end of march first of april and he would go back to the office back to northeastern massachusetts the office was in boston and uh he would go back to the office for a month and then you'd go up to canada fishing uh, for a month or two uh, up in the northeast in Canada for uh, for a month or two and then he'd come back to the office for a month and then he'd go out west big game hunting for a couple of months he was living the dream and <laughs> and then he'd come back to the office for a month and then it was time to come back down here so he very had a little, hard very, life very little work in there he had a hard life <laughs> yeah. man you know we, but uh, y'all seen the the telephone in the hall uh -huh. in there uh, I was told that he was very instrumental in getting the phone line uh, from Memphis to LaGrange, but then also from LaGrange up to here to where he could be in contact with the office. Well, right, because you got to work from home. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So you mentioned shovel and tool company, and that's who made this sword, right? On our table in front of us? <laughs> well, we have to get the sword. <laughs> y yes and no. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, you know, his, his company made just shovels, and from what I understand, uh, they're in northeastern Massachusetts today. They have the Ames Shovel Museum that has over 274 different types of shovels. Wow. I bet you didn't know you could have 274 <laughs> different types of shovels. And so they made their money primarily when the railroad moved from east to west, the president at that time put the Ames brothers in charge of building a railroad. And so they provided all of the hand tools because they didn't have bulldozers and trackos and backhoes and and so they moved a lot of the of the of the of the land of the dirt to, to build the railroad beds with shovels. Mm -hmm. And so they provided the hand tools. Okay. That helped out the business. And then uh, uh, Mr. Ames's cousin had the Ames Foundry. Oh, okay. Which made cannons and rifles and pistols and swords. And this is actually a, uh, uh, it's a Union sword that was uh, captured on a supply train near Franklin, Tennessee. And it was captured by a captain out of Texas named Saul Ross. And Saul Ross uh, later became uh, president of Texas A&M, and then he also became governor of Texas. And uh, Dr. Doug Guthrie was a podiatrist from Waco, Texas, and he taught Civil War history. And he says, I've got something I've got to bring you. I know it's, I know it, it's part of Mr. Ames. And I said, what? He said, it's a sword. And so when he brought it, when you pull this out and look at it, it says Ames Foundry. And so we did some some 
research on that and found that it was actually Mr. Ames's cousin okay. that did that. So, wow. but we have the Saul Raw sword, and That's we actually cool. have some cannons on this place too. Uh, we have a few. <laughs> yes, they're in the brick stables. There you go. So that that could you know there's a whole nother all kinds there's a whole nother episode and that's part of the discussion today we, we you've mentioned I think in here there's 225 historical buildings on this property something like that well we've got uh, we've got Structures. quite a few historical sites on okay. the place and uh, my assistant Jamie Evans it uh, helps with the archaeology or he is the amateur archaeologist on the place and he works with Rhodes College we have a uh, uh, we host a uh, an archaeological field school with Rhodes College each year uh, where they have students that come out here and spend three weeks in residence with us, usually the last two weeks of May and the first week of June. And they take one of these historical sites that's located on this place, and, and they're actually looking at the uh, at the slaves that were here at that time mm. and how uh, where they lived and what they had. And, and they're trying to go back through these areas and, and dig up the... The, uh, uh, the artifacts that were left there, uh, where the houses were and, and where they worked and that sort of thing. And so uh, we worked with, with Rhodes College doing that. And then the University of Memphis, uh, their anthropology department, uh, they're looking at, we have four Indian mounds on the place. And so they're looking into the Indian mounds and those go back. They have, they've been into one of those mounds and pulled charcoal out and those are dated back to 1200. Wow. And so that's really neat to, to follow that. What we didn't know is just outside of those four mounds was a village. And it was about seven acres of village. And we've been farming that land ever since I've been here. And it was probably about eight years ago we decided to quit farming that because every time we'd farm it, we'd turn up artifacts. Mm. And so uh, we stopped farming that. We planted Bermuda grass on it, so we cut hay for the horses. And... Uh, uh, but they would, uh, they started, they, they have some new instruments now that they can run over the ground, uh, like ground penetrating radar, and they can determine uh, where uh, a house was. They can find holes in there, and they found where an old palisade fence went around the perimeter of that thing to take, uh, you know, to protect the villagers there from uh, another uh, uh, tribe that may attack them. And so wow. we found where the old palisade fence were we found where buildings were out there and the university of memphis is looking into those and and trying to document uh, a lot of that as yeah, well that's pretty cool. so uh, jamie has also located uh, uh, 26 cemeteries that were previously undocumented they were unknown uh, there's a forage or a grass called periwinkle uh, a plant that you find and they planted a lot of periwinkle where cemeteries were graveyard grass is what my mom used to call it <laughs> when it? we were that, chasing uh, east tennessee go. history wow uh, yeah, but it's been a lot of could, summers. You can find Periwinkle. Now, one of the coolest things that we've had going on lately involving the cemeteries is uh, University of Memphis has a graduate student that's working on his degree using dogs. And Amy, mm -hmm. you'd be really interested in this. They have dogs that he would take to a cemetery and a lot of these cemeteries do not have headstones. Okay. And so you would find some depressions in there. And so, yeah, that's probably a grave. But this dog would go through that cemetery and when he found a grave, he would go and he would sit down on that. Then they'd come back with ground penetrating radar and prove it that it was there. Now, how can that wow. dog find that mm -hmm. find that grave when it's a hundred to two hundred years old that's a good question isn't it it's amazing it really is but there, there's there's three dogs that we've seen so far that are capable of doing that and a lot of these are cadaver dogs that they use mm -hmm. in disaster relief in those type situations but that's really cool now i, I do want to back up wait, wait, on something how did we get from mr ames and his wife yes. julia to Ames Plantation and what it is today. I chase a lot of rabbits. I, and I, I know. Have to I know. Hey, well, it was a squirrel, squirrel. <laughs> I let him down another trail too. <laughs> it was <so>. a squirrel. <laughs> but uh, uh, Mr. Ames, uh, Mr. Ames developed this place basically, and then Mr. Ames passed away in 1945. Well, he left this place to Mrs. Ames. They had no children. Mrs. Ames's mother died in childbirth with her, and her grandmother died in childbirth with her mother. So it didn't take her long to figure out she didn't want any part of that. And so all they had was dogs and horses. And when he passed away in 45, he left this place to her. And prior to her death in 1950, she got with her lawyers and the lawyers of the state of Tennessee, and they agreed upon her death they would create the Hobart Ames Foundation to own and operate the Ames Plantation 
for the benefit of the University of Tennessee, which means that the University of Tennessee can come down here and do research. And we have a few pieces of UT equipment on the place, but the University of Tennessee does not own any land here nor buildings here, so everything is owned by the Hobart Ames Foundation, and we do business as the Ames Plantation. And it was at that time in 1950 that they, uh, they designated Ames Plantation as a fill station, and we were a fill station for 10 years years before they made uh, the Ames Plantation into an official experiment station. Mm. And so we operate as one of 10 research, well, it, at that time it was a branch experiment station, agriculture experiment station, and they've later uh, changed that terminology to ag research, and these are research and education centers, and so we're one of 10 research and education centers within the University of Tennessee system. There's three in West Tennessee, Milan, Jackson, and we're the southwestern portion here so yeah. and now out of that 18,400 acres about 15,000 is in Fayette County and about 3,500 or so is in Hardman County and so we span two counties and uh, the field trial course actually is in half of Fayette County and half in Hardman County so that works out well as well and both counties support us tremendously right well. and everybody knows Ames is the national championship all right but it is so much more we talked about a little bit on the historical research but you all are hunting and outdoor recreation oh absolutely absolutely with uh, with the field trials beyond beyond the field trials uh we have a deer hunting club and uh that deer hunting club is uh we've had a quality deer management program underway here since uh, about 2003 is when we started taking the preliminary data on the uh, quality deer management herd and then we actually started implementing that project i think it was about 2006 or so and uh we have uh we've maintained a pretty doggone good herd uh, taking bucks and does, uh, a good buck to doe ratio, mm -hmm. uh, and everything was just looking really, really good until CWD hit. Yeah, <sighs> we'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, but you're also quail hunts. You're also turkey hunting. You're also some squirrel hunting. Yeah. So it just doesn't end with deer hunting. We started out with the deer hunting club and we superimposed the, the quality deer management uh, project was actually a research project with the University of Tennessee. And initially we had deer and turkey together. But then we had such a demand for both of them. We had some people that said, look, we're only a member because we want to hunt turkeys, but we have to be the deer. Right. And we don't want no deer. We want turkeys and the others vice versa. And so finally we just decide okay we'll split it so we have a deer hunting club we have a turkey hunting club now our, our deer hunting club uh, we, we talk about that membership uh, yes it changes some each year but it's a soft waiting list there okay. the turkey hunting club these <laughs> guys funny. are hardcore yeah. yeah i mean we can have a vacancy and then have that vacancy filled in 10 minutes yeah. or less wow and so we've got uh, we've got quite a few turkeys on the place we've developed a couple of quail hunting courses on the place and and uh, we've done uh, we don't advertise the quail hunting. We do that just by word of mouth. Uh, and we've had to kind of pause that a little bit because of my bird dogs. I had a, I had a turnover in bird dogs. I had one mm. that developed cancer and one that just, poor fella, he got old. And so uh, we lost him too. But we're in the process of, of getting some dogs back for that. Uh, Y'all awesome. are also wildlife research. Y'all, you've done, a, and, and real quick on those uh kind of because we've got some other things we got to bring up in here so <laughs> well the wildlife research has been uh oh gosh we we've done extensive wildlife re research on quail obviously 70 from years the, worth of quail from the national championship uh, you know mr ames was working with herb stoddard herb stoddard wrote the book on quail biology mm -hmm. and uh we found some old paperwork uh in a desk in the gun room that was uh between herb stoddard and mr ames and they were talking about raising red quail the tennessee red the tennessee wow. red the tennessee and as it turns out it that is a recessive gene but they were they were sending rail uh, quail back and forth via railroad from thomasville georgia to ames plant to grand junction tennessee and so that's how the tennessee red developed and we've we've had that here and that's also ames is known for the tennessee reds, tennessee reds awesome. absolutely wow and cool. so we've uh, we've got that so we've done uh, we've done radio telemetry work with quail uh, and uh, and got quite a bit of work done on that. We've done the deer work. We've done work with coyotes. We work with the University of Memphis, Dr. Mike Kennedy down there, mm. uh, where we put uh, uh, 
collars. It was one of the first GPS collars ever put on uh, a coyote, and we put that on on him, and they tracked that dude, and he wound up. Uh, somebody killed him over near Savannah, near Pickwick. Uh, and so, so traveling actually yes. yeah traveling yeah. actually got the the collar back on that coyote but you know that's what 55 60 miles so mm-hmm. that's that was interesting within that but we've worked with mike uh, not only on that but then also on small mammalian predators uh, this place is large enough that at one time we had five different locations we have uh, we'd, we'd fix up a square mile and we had one square mile here and then four more spread across the place so you had five locations so that increased your degrees of freedom with the statistics Mm -hmm. portion of it to to where you could have more locations and he had graduate students that put traps on those and they ran trap lines and those poor guys oh gosh when they ran a trap line they were walking eight or nine miles at a time yeah you know it was nothing for them to walk almost 300 miles in two weeks uh, one one of them, uh, Brian Carver, always joked that he had walked from here to the Gulf Coast and back. You know, <laughs> and we've already done a show on the tick research here. We Absolutely, did that with Alan yeah. Houston, yes. uh, Dr. Alan yeah. Houston. Go back and check that one out. Check that one out if you want to learn that. Um, but uh, one thing we probably need to talk about is the third oldest registered Angus herd in the U.S. A lot of people don't know that. Absolutely, and Absolutely. it is an impressive. If you're a cattle guy, this or <laughs> yeah. gal, this is. This is impressive. It, it is neat. Uh, Mr. Ames started this herd back in 1913, actually got his breeding stock from Scotland, and uh, from Aberdeen, Scotland, and this is Aberdeen Angus, and uh, Mr. Ames helped develop the Angus herd in the U.S., and the American Angus Association wrote the history of the American Angus uh, not long ago, and uh, uh in their 100-year history, they referred to Mr. Ames in that book as helping to develop that. Well, my wife and I got, uh, a year before last, got to go on a trip to Scotland and Ireland, and we actually got to spend two nights in Aberdeen, Scotland. And so I got to <laughs> just see... Happened, Ab- just happened just to go happened there. To be yeah, there. Just, just happened. up there. Yeah. Just, so I got to see Aberdeen Angus cattle at that time. Now, we're, we're running about 160 head of cattle right now, uh, mama cows, and uh, that's registered Angus. And then we've got about 30 crossbred cattle, either Hereford Angus or Angus Semitol, uh, that was left over from a research project that we did where we were comparing straight-bred Angus to Hereford Angus crosses to Angus Semitol crosses. And so when those finally fade out, we'll be back 100% Angus. But uh-huh. we're trying to get it back up to about 200 head of mama cows. Uh, we have a fall calving herd, and then we uh, superimpose research on that. And um, uh, we've had a native warm season grass research project comparing um, Canadian switchgrass to uh, gamma grass to big blue stem, little blue stem combinations mm-hmm. to Bermuda grass to orchard grass. And... Uh, uh, you know, the Canadian switchgrass, that switchgrass will give about uh, about two pounds of gain a day on steers. And uh, we looked at heifers as well. So, uh, yes, we, we do a lot of research. The vet school. And, the, I say, and you do a lot of teaching here. I was getting ready to go there. Good, yeah, well, good yeah. way to just lead into that. Yeah. The, uh, the College of Veterinary Medicine spends, uh, uh, when I first started here, they were spending a week in residence with us at that time. Now, at that time, we not only had the beef cattle herd, but we also had a swine herd, about 200. 40 sows, complete fair to finish operation. We were selling somewhere between five, 6,000 head of hogs a year. Then we had a grade A dairy milking about 75 cows online, Holstein wow. cows. And so uh, we, we conducted research with the dairy and with the swine unit up until the point that uh, the, the swine herds were, were really going down, the numbers were declining in the state, uh, and as well as the dairy herds. And when the University of Tennessee decided they didn't need a grazing dairy anymore to do research, then we closed that out and 99 and then the uh, the swine industry had really dropped down North Carolina had picked up a lot more over there and so we decided to go ahead and uh, close out the swine herd and we we sold the last hogs here in June of 03 I think is when it was okay and so we still have the beef cattle herd that we do research with and then we have row crops and you also have horses 
Oh, we do have horses. Yeah. Yes. Can't the horses that. with the field trials. And yes. At one time, we were maintaining, oh gosh, we had almost 45 head of horses right. on the place. Now, the vet students, we now, were This talking, is where the vet students We were talking in. about the vet students. The vet students, I told you at that time, were coming down three times a year. They come down twice a year now. And they work with our beef herd and with the horses that we have. And it gives those students, it's a senior vet students, and they it, those that are, want to practice large animal, mm -hmm. they get a chance to get hands-on experience. And I know in East Tennessee, a lot of the fancy horse operations over there, when students show up to work on those, uh, owners kind of, you know, just a little bit skeptical <laughs> about that, about a student. that They'd rather have the professor or the veterinarian right, working on that yeah. and so well heck i'm the same way when you go somewhere they say hey this med student wants to work <laughs> yeah, on you i don't yeah, know about that yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway they here they can work on animals and there's no questions i mean we just we just let them go at it and so, they're well prepared when they when absolutely they, leave, yeah. they, they get to work on their horses here they work on the cattle here they bleed them they vaccinate them uh anything that's abnormal that we need looked at while they're here they do that mm. and so they spend they spend time here uh we have the uh, the forestry students from mm -hmm. Forestry Wildlife and Fisheries, undergraduate yep. students, spend two weeks in residence here. The last week of August and the first week of September at one time, it was a spring forestry camp. Now it's a fall forestry camp. And so those folks get uh, classroom instruction in the morning, hands-on in the afternoon. Uh, we were talking about the Rhodes College. They get hands-on in the morning. They get classroom in the afternoon. When it's hotter, they're in the inside where the air conditioning yeah, is. Yeah. So that works out very well. And y'all have got, uh, you've done a bunch of forestry research here too. So kind of ties back in. Oh gosh, yes. Uh, Dr. Alan Houston is our forester wildlife biologist. And I believe y'all talked with him mm -hmm. about ticks before. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Alan has, uh, he's worked with a lot of foresters, works with a lot of folks through UT. Dr. Scott Schlarbaum is a forest geneticist. And uh, we have a lot of work with Scott and Alan. Uh, Alan and Scott work together on that. Uh, Alan has a lot of research on his own uh, crop tree enhancement mm -hmm. work uh, where he has 30 crop trees per acre uh, that he looks at and develops those and they have some fertilized some unfertilized so they're looking at all kinds of research with forestry and, and superimposing now we're, we're running out of time and we've got to get this in because yes. we are standing in Mrs. Ames sitting room and you've got to explain the wallpaper because well, if you've been looking at the background you're like what is going on yeah, so it's pretty cool please explain well let's talk about the house first real quick <clears throat> we've got uh, the uh, uh, the house was built in 1847 the front section the west wing added in 1880 and then the wing that Mr. Ames had was added in uh, in 1902 mm -hmm. and uh what uh, what he did then, uh, after he got that developed, the wallpaper in here he actually bought from uh, uh, an outfit in New York, and this is this is only one copy. In, this is the only copy of this wallpaper in the United States. It was hand painted by a Frenchman named Delacourt in 1849, and has it won the gold medal for wallpaper exhibition in 1850. Wow! And. Uh, there are four copies of it in the world. The Louvre Museum in Paris has one copy. There's a house in Spain that has 14 of the 16 panels. There's 16 panels to a scene. And there's a house in, uh, in Bulgaria that has a copy. And we have the only copy in the U.S. So That's amazing. It was appraised at between $250,000 to a $1 million. That is awesome. And it is, I, I don't know if you can see it up close. We might need to try to do some video or some pictures sure, to yeah. show on the show. But it is uh, It is so detailed, and it is just, it's it's immaculate. Yeah. I mean, it's just. And if you look in the hall, you have a, Zubair wallpaper. Mm -hmm. And it's in its 16th edition printing today. We have a first edition printing. Very unique. Wow. If you want to check out the Ames Plantation, go online, amesplantation.org. Uh -huh. And Facebook, at Ames Plantation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Carlisle, for, for this day and, and this interview. This has been awesome. And uh, I want to thank everybody for watching. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And keep coming back. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in. Stay connected with TWRA by visiting our website at tnwildlife.org. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hey, it's all about Tennessee wildlife. It's what we do. Tennessee Wildcast will be on the air again next week. We'll see you then.